every eye see, let every eternal life be the open. All right, thank you, thank you, Bob, for that uh, nice uh, <laughs> for that intro. Once he gets started, it's hard to get him shut down. But, uh, so to praise God, that power surge didn't uh, damage the accordion, right? <laughs> that would have been terrible. <laughs> All right, uh, welcome, welcome everyone this morning to uh, Exeter Bible Fellowship. Glad to have everyone with us. Uh, special welcome to those watching by video as well, and uh, welcome to. Uh, the Bechtel family, we've got visiting from Durham, uh, so Jason, and I'm going to have to look at my notes here to get them all, Jason, Angie, Delena, Lorelei, Mael, and Uriah. Apologies if I mispronounced any names, but uh, welcome to all of you. We're, we're very glad to have you with us this morning. And uh, Jason is, uh, as I mentioned, from, uh, from the Durham area and with uh, Ethnos, um, formerly New Tribes. Um, so uh, it's been a few years, I think, since he's been here. He'll uh, give a little more background on himself and, and the work that Ethnos does when he comes up later. He's been with Ethnos, he said, since uh, 2006, so a good while. Um, so we look forward to, to hearing from him later. Let's just open with a word of prayer. Our loving God and Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this uh, privilege, again, to gather together. And uh, Father, we, we know that you are here in our midst, in our presence, and uh, we we are just in awe when we uh, think of who you are. What, a, what an awesome God we serve. And we think that you, uh, you simply spoke into being uh, all, the, all that we see around us and, and the things beyond the limits of our, our vision and imagination. We're, we're astounded and continue to be astounded as we, we hear new discoveries in, the, in this universe and, and keep learning it's, it's bigger uh, and more awesome than even we, we could have imagined. And uh, Father, this is all just a, a wonderful testament to, to your greatness, to your power, to who you are. For Father, we know you are greater than, than these things you've created. And uh, there, is, there is no other uh, who is like you, all-powerful, uh, present everywhere. As we were reminded so well last, last week, there, there's nowhere we can go uh, that, that you are not present. And Father, we... We thank you for, for your Holy Spirit that you have sent to, to live within us. And uh, we thank you most of all for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We had a, a wonderful time this morning remembering him and, and uh, how precious he is to us. Uh, Lord, uh, with, without him, where would we be? We'd be hopelessly lost. And so we thank you for the wonderful Savior, wonderful salvation that you have provided freely to all who will receive it. Lord, if there's anyone here who is not receive Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, we pray that today might be the day that they would not put it off any longer. Father, we uh, do pray a special blessing upon our brother Jason as he comes later to minister to us. Uh, we thank you for him and, and his family and uh, just ask that you would uh, continue to bless, uh, protect, encourage them. And uh, Father, we just uh, pray that you would challenge our hearts this morning. Each one would, would uh, go away having been challenged and encouraged from your word. Lord, we pray for those who are, are not able to be here. Uh, we know there are some who are, are sick, traveling. Lord, uh, we just lift them up. We uh, pray especially for, uh, for the, the Ben Gardner family and, and this fire that they've just had. Lord, we just pray that you would uh, uh, protect them. We thank you that, that uh, uh, the, the losses don't sound too great. So, Father, we thank you even in that you, you had your protection over them. So, Lord, just bless uh, the rest of our time together this morning, we ask. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Yeah, it's a beautiful hymn, isn't it? A uh, beautiful declaration of the, uh, the uh, surety that we have in Christ, the security in him. And, uh, well, we're privileged this morning to have with us, uh, again, our brother Jason, uh, Bechtel uh, from Ethnos, so uh, get your slides queued up here, Jason, and then uh, invite you to come up and, and share what the Lord's laid on your heart. 
thank you guys for the opportunity to come today. For those of you who are wondering how to spell my kids' names, there it is. So, and you did very well. Uh, you got the difficult ones. Lorelai is how we say Lorelai's name. So, but Delina, most people have trouble with that one. Mael as well. And Uriah is a biblical name. Um, both my wife and I come from the area in a sense in that Clinton is where we went through high school and where we've got family. And there's a, a red-shirted gentleman back here on my right that, um, full disclosure, that's my uncle, Graham. He is married to my dad's sister. If I got that right, I think so. So, um, just again, context to who we are, um, both my wife and I, Angie, and I um, came to understand of our need of a Savior around the age of five. And we're blessed to be raised in uh, Christ-honoring homes, um, church-going homes. Um, we went through high school together. Uh, we're in the same university town, going to Bethel Chapel in Waterloo during those years. And then after university, got married and quickly moved into uh, working with Ethnos. And so Ethnos is an organization that used to be called New Tribes Mission. And so our mandate as an organization is to plant churches where there are no known believers. And so that often looks um, like rural and untouched um, ethnic groups that have been isolated from the, the gospel, from the good news. Um, so on one extreme, we're helicoptering into the middle of deepest, darkest, wherever. Learning an unwritten language, coming up with an alphabet for them, teaching them how to read and write their own language, translating the Bible into that language, translating or working on less scripture development or lesson, lesson development to teach chronological foundational Bible lessons, um, to plant that firm foundation of who God is right from Genesis, and then laying those thematic principles throughout the Word of God till you get to the New Testament where you've got the uh, John the Baptist saying, Behold, the Lamb of God. Okay, what's a Lamb? And is their understanding of God the same as ours? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin. What is sin? So all of these things are unpacked in the Old Testament. And so the Ethnos has a framework of Bible lessons that we teach in these very isolated ethnic groups around the world. And as is been mentioned, uh, we moved there in 2006 to be trained as cross-cultural church planters and never left. We got asked to stay on staff. So instead of moving to Indonesia, which was the plan, and being a blessing to the field there, we got asked to stay in Durham. And now my role is to oversee all of the media end of things. So whether that's print or digital, video, um, all of those things, I now work with a team that handles all of the media and marketing for Ethnos Canada and New Zealand as well. Um, we help them with a lot of their stuff as well. Jungle Camp was something that got mentioned downstairs between meetings. And we do anticipate having a Jungle Camp this coming summer, a year from now, next July. There are nine Canadians and three Americans planning on moving to Durham in August, should the border allow the Americans to come in. And so, the, you know, all these things, uh, how do you do social distancing? How do you have these families on campus? Uh, my wife's now helping with the oversight of the K through 12 school that we have on our campus for the children of the missionary candidates and staff kids. And so just looking at all of those logistics, we just found out yesterday a family that was in Mongolia that came home that some of you know of. Um, and because I said Mongolia, I'm not going to say their names. Um, they were hoping to go back the end of the summer, and now they're probably going to be here to the end of the year. And so looking to have their kids enroll in the school in Durham. So just different dynamics in these days where everything changes every week to two weeks. Um, we appreciate your prayers. Um, as we navigate these things, as we equip families to do what still needs to be done, bring the gospel to people who have never been exposed to it, who don't have Christians in their communities at all. Um, so that's where we tend to send missionaries. So those were some of my opening thoughts. Um, another facet of that, of our work, is bringing our approach of ministry to the indigenous people within Canada, something that many people in Canada are quite excited about. 
Uh, we had a family, it was uh, a family from the U.S. that came through the training in Durham a couple years ago who are wanting to take their family to the Arctic. And so they were up there, supposed to be up there for the month of March, but they caught the last flight out um, during the pandemic and flew home to Ontario and uh, are now waiting this out and now making plans, okay, if we can't go back into that community where we have a place to live, um, because of the pandemic, how might God redirect us? And so we are starting to send families up north. We just had a family from the Netherlands who came through Durham, move up to north of Aurelia to our reserve there. And so they're starting to go out um, and to um, yeah, impact lives for the sake of the gospel. So if you are interested in learning more about that, um, slip me a piece of paper with your email address on it. And I'd love to sign you up for email updates about what God is doing um, through Ethnos in Canada and around the world. All right. What's your favorite team sport? Anyone bold enough to yell out their favorite team sport? Baseball. Another favorite team sport? Soccer. Soccer. So my next question was, can anyone guess what the most popular team sport in the entire world is, and it happens to be soccer, as we know it by that name here. Um, it happens, soccer happens to be my favorite team sport. It's the only sport that I played when I was a youth. And I can still remember on the hot summer days, biking from our home in the country outside Blythe, a couple miles, Rice's store. Anybody remember Rice's store? So we lived there. That was a, a family business that my mom took over um, when I was um, 12, maybe, 13, biking into Blythe to run up and down a soccer field in the heat of the summer and then biking all the way back out to Rice's store. Those are some of my memories of playing soccer. There was also um, just how much I enjoyed when we finally did move to New Tribes and four nights a week you could find me out on the soccer field. It was the sport of choice. Now, soccer is something I don't enjoy even watching on TV. I don't enjoy watching any sports on TV, but I thoroughly in love being out on the field and running up and down the field. For me, soccer is not a spectator sport. It's not a sport that is best observed from the bleachers, in my opinion. It's also a sport that requires, like baseball, different people with different skills playing different positions. So in soccer, you've got a goalie whose role is different than the defenseman whose roles are different than the forwards. So on the soccer team, I'm going to use this illustration for this morning as we talk about body life principles. So soccer is a team sport, one with different roles. Um, and not only do you need to have people on your team with different skills, but you need to have all of those players out on the field. Soccer doesn't work if everybody stays home or if those who do show up simply warm the bench. So on a soccer team, if you're going to win, you need different skills and you need everybody plugging in. The local church, Exeter Bible Fellowship, is in some ways like a soccer team in that it's not a spectator sport. Over these last four months, I've been thinking about this pandemic and, and about what a thriving church looks like. And what are some of the dynamics? Because different churches have different dynamics. Some have more than 100 people, more than 200 people. Some churches have paid staff, some do not. And which of these dynamics are going to help a church come out of the pandemic thriving? Better off than it was before? Because I anticipate some churches are going to close their doors. I know of one Baptist church in Hanover that if what I've heard is true and accurate, does not plan to reopen. Um, so it's, you know, what does a thriving church look like? Especially in light of these last four months. A couple of years ago, I heard about one church that actually asked people who were only coming on Sunday to not come on Sundays. That that congregation had limited capacity and they wanted the seats in there to be there for people who were willing to plug into the life of the body throughout the week. They understood that church was not a spectator sport. I heard of another church in the U.S. that encouraged and expected their congregants, the members of their church, to plug in to relationships four times a week. Sunday mornings 
or on a weekend, they expected everyone to get together. But they also expected everybody to, on a weekly basis, as much as possible, to be part of a small group. But they also wanted each person to be in not just one, but two discipleship relationships. One where they were being mentored, but a second one where they were mentoring someone who was younger in the faith. Could you imagine, and, and you know your congregation, this group better than I, if the leadership stood up and said, we expect everybody here, as much as possible, to be engaged four times every week in these ways. How would that sit with this group? You guys know the answer to that. Church is not a spectator sport. And before you guys start scratching your heads going, where is Jason going with this? Let's just take a pause and let's look at what the Word of God says about these things. And when I think of the Word of God and body life principles, I think of spiritual gifts. In my mind, I can think of four different places in the New Testament where God has given us instructions on spiritual gifts. What are some of those chapters where we find that? So, Bob, you, I know you should know one of these. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to go there a little bit later, so that's not the first one. There's three others, one of which you, I don't expect you guys to get necessarily. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, yes. Romans chapter 4 is where we're going to start off with. And then 1 Peter chapter 4, there is a mention as well. So let's turn to Romans chapter 4, and we'll start unpacking some of these truths there. Diversity within the body is one of the things that we're going we're gonna to look at this morning. Um, one of the things that I really like about the Romans context and the first, or in the Ephesians context, is that these verses about spiritual gifts come after the gospel has been laid out clearly as what has been done for us. But let me back up and summarize where we're going to go today. Two key truths. How God has intentionally given a diversity of gifts. And that if we don't use the gifts that he has given each one of us in the church, the whole body will suffer. And so as we start to go into this first one, this first idea of a diversity of gifts, here are those four passages that we just listed off. And what I want to point out before we start reading in Romans chapter 12 is that we're talking, or was, this is being addressed to believers, those who are members of the church, who are already believers, and is talking about works. And one of the things that I am careful to point out is that our salvation is not based on works. And that in the Romans, in Romans, we've got 11 chapters that lay the gospel out clearly. And in Ephesians, we've got three chapters. The first half of the book lays out the gospel clearly. And it's upon that foundation of our position in Christ that we can talk about our practice for Christ. After having realized what has been done for us, we can start to talk about what we can do for Christ. And if we get those things backwards, we get confused. And so these passages are directed at believers. Another interesting point that comes up in these verses is this idea of unity being tied with this, this idea of diversity. When we think about diversity, we think of disunity. We think of friction and tension and fighting. And yet, in the Word of God, that's not the case. Diversity does not equal division. And what helps us clarify some of that is unity does not look like uniformity. We do not all need to look the same way and function the same way. We have been gifted in unique and a diverse set of ways. And that allows us to have unity if we understand things in these ways. And so, let's start looking at Romans chapter 12. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, 
but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many members, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in, in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberal, liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. At Ethnos, I have the opportunity of working with some different people. And I, I say that in a loving way, because truth be told, I'm probably the odd man out. On the scale of people who are super task-focused and others who are super relationship and people-focused, I'm stronger on the task side, and I need people to surround me who are thinking about people's being cared for. But those people who are in leadership, who care about people, sometimes have gotten on my nerves. Because I, they're not passionate about the same things that I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about getting things done in the most efficient way. And yet when we're caring for people, when we're dealing with people, sometimes getting things done isn't always the first priority. And the people who are on opposite ends of the spectrum need each other in order to function well. One book that I read as I was thinking about these things said there's probably only 4% of the population that is wired like me. And when I heard that, and as I wrestled through some of these dynamics, I was going to say tensions, I realized that if the whole world was wired like me, the world would not be a better place. I used to think that way. I don't know if any of you have thought that way. But I've come to realize that if this whole world was filled with people who were wired like me, it would be worse off than it is now, not better. That there can only be so many Jasons in this world, and there can only be so many Bobs in this world, and only so many Grahams in this world. And if the whole world was filled with me, it would be worse off. Um, a word that sometimes my kids throw around is the word weird. And they love putting this acronym to it of wonderful, exquisite, imperfect, real, and different. And it puts a positive spin on the fact that we're all weird in our own different way. And we need to celebrate this. We need to thank God for the weirdness that is a part of this congregation, of a part of this church. We need each other. We need your weirdness and we need my weirdness because your strengths compensate for my many and innumerable problems and my strengths compensate for your one or two barely recognizable weaknesses. Now the word of God says that there was only ever one perfect man, the man Christ Jesus. And the flip side of that, you are not perfect and I am not perfect. God has not given me, he's not given any of you all of the spiritual gifts. The entire list has not been given to anybody. And so, in order for all of the gifts that God has given to be utilized, we need each other. Some in this church are very capable at teaching, but not all. Some in this church are exceptional shepherds, but not all. Some in this church are functioning in their sweet spot when they are quietly cleaning during the week between meetings. Some are really good administrators. Some of you are exceptional leaders. Some are cheerful givers. Some are really good with kids, but not all. We need each other. The elders and the leadership at this church can only thrive in their area of ministry if the rest of the body does their part, freeing up those leaders to function where God has specifically, intentionally wired them to function. And likewise, if the shyest of you out there were expected to come up here on the platform week after week, it would be a painful experience for everybody. The secret is to recognize that God has intentionally made and gifted each one of us differently and that the gaps that each of us have are filled by somebody else in the body. 
we complement each other. Instead of getting irritated by somebody else's weirdness, by their differentness, we need to appreciate it and recognize it as necessary and needed and of great value. Just like a soccer team has players with different skills and gifts, the local church, God's body as he has designed it, needs a diversity of people with a diversity of gifts. And so we're going to move into the second key truth this morning. Not being harsh with those who are different is one thing. But if half of the congregation, half of a soccer team stayed home, or if they did come, just sat on the bench, it wouldn't be a thriving team. It wouldn't be a thriving church. And so this passage in Ephesians that we could go to actually says that God gave people to the church for this, that, and the other thing. You are a gift from God to this church. And if you stay home or if you don't plug in in the ways that God has enabled you to plug in, the whole body is going to suffer for it. Those of you who know me know that I'm not someone who necessarily lacks confidence. Um, I'm known for wearing pink shirts. That's the most popular color in my wardrobe. Another thing that people find odd or weird about me is that I enjoy wearing socks and sandals 365 days of a year, even in the dead of winter. I actually wore Birkenstocks with my tuxedo on our wedding. We've got photos to document it. I'm comfortable being me. Um, not everybody has that same confidence. Not everybody's comfortable being weird and different and standing up on the platform and teaching to a group of complete strangers, or even worse for me, a group of family and friends who know me better than I know myself sometimes. And because of this confidence, I have had to, over the years, remind myself, Jason, you are not a gift from God to this world. I sometimes struggle with some of that thinking. So imagine the confusion that I had these last couple weeks as I was studying this out to realize, actually, I am a gift from God, not necessarily to this world, but to his church. But it's not Jason who is a gift. It is Christ in me who is a gift to the congregation where we gather, to the church at large. And it's not you in your flesh who is a gift to this congregation. It is Christ in you who is a gift and who is enabling you to be a gift, that you are God's gift to your local body. And if you don't plug in, you're robbing Christ's body of a member of a part of his body. Another part of this is the fact that these gifts have been given to us, that we as individual members of the body have been given to the church as an act of grace. And how do you remember what grace is and how it's different than mercy? Well, here's an acronym that I like to remember that helps me comprehend what grace is. God's riches at Christ's expense. For me, that's a simple and easy way to remember what grace is. And it's because of grace that any of us have anything to offer to the body, to Christ's body. So to summarize and go over some of these truths, Christ is the head of the body. God is the one who has, through an act of grace, and gifted each of us differently. No one person has all of the gifts Every believer is given at least one spiritual gift. The gifts are given for the building up of the body, for the glory of God. Now I want to pivot this a little bit and, and think about unreached people groups. Um, but before we go there, let's turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And let's do a little bit of reading there. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we've got this picture of the human body, a great biblical illustration of what the local church can look like. And it helps to unpack some of this as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 15. If the foot should say, because I'm not, of a, not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? And if the whole body were hearing, where would be the smelling? 
But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And we can go on one of the other verses. I'm just going to skip down to verse 22. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Each one of you are necessary. And then skipping down to verse 25, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all of the members suffer with it. And if one member is honored, then all of the members rejoice with it. I'm fortunate to have never broken a bone. I've never torn a tendon, but I know many of you have experienced what it's like to have a member of your physical body not doing the part that it was designed to do. And how the one part of your body, one member of your body not functioning in the way God designed it to do can put strain on the rest of your body. And how that can be so difficult and painful. In the same way, the local church needs each one of us to function in the unique way that God has wired us for the benefit of the whole. Without getting too legalistic and and thinking about how much each one of us ought to plug in, let me ask, are you using the spiritual gift or spiritual gifts that God has given you specifically for the benefit of your local church? So we've seen how members of the local church, when freed to do what they were specifically and uniquely and gifted to do, function in a beautiful and a God-honoring way where he gets the glory. And I want to pivot now some parallels. We've looked at local church ministry, and you guys can imagine what, how that all works out. Uh, but what about cross-cultural ministry? What about the church on mission? The church that is seeking to complete the Great Commission. I am blessed to come from a church that knows the value of support roles and knows that, that they are necessary, that they're part of the healthy functioning of the church on mission. There was a number of families that came before Angie and I out of our local church that served in support roles, so we didn't feel like we had to f- swim against the stream and have unrealistic expectations put on us about what ministry looks like for a full-time commended family. And yet I know, and I've even heard in the last couple of months, of families who have come home from a year or more overseas and they're faced with questions around how many people have given their lives to the Lord because of that family's ministry. And for that family to say, really none. Um, That our role is a support role. We're not the ones out there... Even once we finish learning the national language, then learning an indigenous language, there's many years sometimes uh, invested in getting to the place of presenting the gospel in a clear way. Some families take a couple years, depending on the context, but not every family is in that role on the team. And so in preparation for this weekend, I did some dress up. So here's a photo of me. Um, wearing some scrubs and a stethoscope to illustrate there are places in this world where full-time workers are going where the medical system is not what we enjoy here in Ontario. And in those developing countries, we often bring medical professionals with us. We'll have nurses and doctors and dentists coming. And if somebody in this congregation or family member of somebody in this congregation has medical skills, and is interested, is feeling led in using those overseas for a year or more, let me know. Write down your name, give me a note, and I will put you in touch with our admissions team. We are needing more medical people overseas. Another facet of life overseas that is different than here in developing countries is their building technologies. Now, just to be warned, I'm showing a little bit of shoulder in this next photo. Construction, home design, home building, these are things that don't happen like we expect them or even feel is safe to be happening overseas. And so often we'll bring work teams to help families build a house in the tribe. And they're choppering in the tin for the roof. They're choppering in uh, a 
a container to collect rainwater for drinking. Um, the places that Ethnos is sending missionaries are off the grid much of the time, and you're having to hook up a solar electric system. So just so you don't have to look at that too much longer, um, we'll just put up this slide of these key truths. So there are practical skills needed on the team as the church is on mission, bringing the gospel to the last unreached people groups. But another facet of this is the linguistics. There might be someone in this congregation who loves puzzles. Can you imagine trying to figure out a language that's got no written form, and you're trying to figure out not only where the parts of speech are, but do they have prefixes and suffixes? Are those separate words, or is that just one long run-on word that has so many prefixes and suffixes that you can use 26 characters and the word is this long? Figuring out how to conjugate verbs, past tense, future tense. I did do it, I am doing it, I'm going to do it. Um, imagine 30 different ways of conjugating verbs um, and trying to figure that out with no study helps and just sorting out that puzzle of language. We need people on the team who God has engifted in that way. And the people who are strong with linguistics likely aren't going to be the guys swinging a hammer. They're likely not going to be the ones that are super strong on the medical side of things. We need to complement them. But we do need those who are strong linguistically. And who love digging into the word of God and spending hours and hours pouring over what was God saying in that passage in order to translate it into a language that just now has a written form. And that the word of God has never clearly been taught in that community. It takes a special type of person who needs to be complemented by a special type of person. Each of us have a role on the team. So we need doctors. We need construction workers. Even school teachers. If we were to take our family overseas, we're not going to enroll them in the same school as, as the local villagers because they might not have a school there. And so some families are bringing live-in school teacher nanny. And I know of a couple families, well, Easton's Dennis and Valor Easton, that name might mean something to some of you. They built a, a suite in their basement of the house in the village for the school teacher to live in. And so they have at different times had a school teacher, someone, some, a young lady in her tw uh, early 20s, um, move in and help Valerie with the education of their kids. That's